Where are we in our study? And what is John 17? The high priestly prayer of Christ. I, I can't do it justice. This, is, this, this prayer of Christ, it's the high water mark in the ministry of Jesus. If John were the temple, as I've said before, then, then these five chapters during the Seder, the Passover that Jesus celebrated with his disciples, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, are, are the, the holy place. But chapter 17 in particular is the holy of holies where we're really going into the presence of God. Jesus is really opening up his heart, his concerns to us. As we get into John 17, we see it's the longest prayer in the New Testament. It's not the longest prayer in the Bible, but it's definitely the longest prayer in the New Testament. Jesus begins in the first five verses praying for himself. And then in verses 6 through 19, which is what we're going to cover this morning, he is praying for his disciples. I think last time we were together and we were in John's Gospel, because last week it was Mother's Day, and we talked about mothers and our responsibility. We talked about fathers and our responsibility. But I think last time we were together in John 17, I only covered the first three verses. And so we're going to quickly go for the first five, and then we'll move on to new territory where Jesus is praying for his disciples. Can we bow our heads and our hearts one more time? Lord... I personally, and I think I speak for everyone in my hearing, we don't want to be deceived. We don't want to be lied to. Lord, you said that whom the Son sets free will be free indeed. You said that your truth will set us free. And then you said that your word, your word, the revelation that you have given us with regard to everything we need to know in our relationships of this life with you and with one another, that your word is truth. So Jesus set us free, set us free by your truth, set us free by the truth of your word, the word of truth, Lord. Help us to have a correct understanding. So many in the church in years gone by realized and knew that orthodoxy, right thinking, always led to orthopraxis, right living. Right thinking leads to right living. And so it's no wonder, Lord, that there's so much wrong living within Christendom today because there's such wrong thinking, erroneous assumptions, made about you, Lord, and about your word. But Lord, this morning, I want your Holy Spirit to take charge. I want your Holy Spirit to speak to me and to my wife and to everyone else in my hearing. Strengthen us, Lord. Mature us, Lord. And help us to take the charge seriously, Lord, that we are to go out into the world and represent you in your love. We're to be used as agents of healing with the message of salvation. Lord, there is nothing that would ail us of mind, spirit, emotion, or body that you can't heal. And so, Lord, we ask for a healing touch this morning from your presence, your presence in your word, Lord. We know that's how you speak to us, Lord through your word. And we know too, Lord, if we want to hear your voice audibly, we just read it out loud. <laughs> but we thank you for your word. I thank you personally for how it has changed my life. I will never, ever, ever be the same person again. And so many of us can bear testimony to the transforming power of you, Jesus, and your word. So speak to us now, we pray. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. So we end in chapter 16. Jesus has had a victory cry, right? He said, these things I have spoken to you, that in me you will have peace. Peace. Yeah, he's offering eternal life, but he said, in me you will have peace. Why? Because in the world you will have? You're going to have troubles, testings, stresses, sufferings, tribulations. But be of good cheer, Jesus said. Why? Yes. Ochranos! Victorious. Yeah, go find out what that means. Ochranos. <laughs> That's your first assignment. Write it down. <laughs> but Jesus cried out. He was victorious over the world. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. How do we overcome the world? How do we become overcomers? By the blood of the Lamb, 
by the word of his testimony, the word of God, and I'm sorry, Ed. We didn't love our life to the end. It's not about my life. It's about living his life. It's about him allowing him to live his life through me. You know, it's not that the world goes to the threshold or the doorstep of a reluctant God. Is he reluctant to save them? No. Unfortunately, the world is at the threshold of the doorstep of a reluctant church that won't get off its duff. It won't come out of its comfort to share the truth of God's word. What percentage of Christians share their faith, share the gospel? Now, I, I hope that you're part of that 2%. You know, so many in the world want to be a 1%er. You know what a 1%er is, right? We're rich, abundantly rich. But we are already obscenely rich, aren't we? Yeah, with all the blessings that we have. But only 2% of the church share their faith. I can bear testimony. This church started simply because I started sharing my faith at work, which led to a Bible study at the plant, which led to a home study, which, which became a church. And it was never my desire to become a pastor or to start a church. I just wanted to do a Bible study. Right, David? That's all I've ever wanted to do now for 30 years is a Bible study. Somebody else can have all the drama associated with pastoring a church. <laughs> I leave that to David. <laughs> but Jesus cried out in victory, I have overcome the world and so have you because we're in Christ. Verse 1 of chapter 17, Jesus spoke these words, everything he said from chapter 13, verse 1 to this point. Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. And we looked at that extensively last time, so you can go back and get the tape. But he kept saying, my hour is not yet, my hour is not yet, my hour is not yet. But now, now, beginning in chapter 12, my hour has come. Chapter 13, verse 1, my hour has come. He's repeating it now, the hour has come. What hour? The hour that he should give his life as a ransom for many. The very purpose for why he came, so that he could give his life. The hour has come, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. Paul tells us in Corinthians that all that we do, whether we speak or act, we're to do to the glory of God, right? Are you living life for God's glory? And how do we live life for God's glory? The same way Jesus did for the Father's glory, in our obedience to his will. In our obedience to his word. His word is given to us so that we would discern and understand the will of God. So many Christians wonder, oh boy, what's God's will for my life? Well, Follow the Holy Spirit, and you'll understand God's will, because the Holy Spirit will lead you to the Word of God, and He'll guide you very specifically, very succinctly, in so many areas of life, and particularly our relationships of life. Paul would write to the church in Thessalonica, do you want to know the will of God? Your sanctification. And what is sanctification? To be set apart to be consecrated, where God wants to use your life to glorify Christ, the Holy Spirit, and the Father, just as Christ lived his life to glorify the Father in heaven by obeying his word. And so too we do. Hmm? Yes, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may also glorify you, as you have given him authority over all flesh. Why does he have authority over all flesh, all creation, all of the world? Because he created it, right? Go back to the first chapter for a moment. John 1. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Isaiah says, those who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Before anything was created, there was a darkness everywhere. In Genesis 1, it tells us, 1, 1, and then the Lord said, light be. That's all it says in the Hebrew, light be. And what happened? Jesus was manifest. This is before the creation of the sun, the moon, the stars, the solar system. Jesus is the light of the world, the life of the world. Apart from him, there is no life. Isn't that true? Yeah. 
as you have given him authority over all flesh, why he's the creator of all things, he's the prototokos of Colossians, the preeminent one in creation and salvation in every area of life, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Eight times, eight times in this chapter, it is declared that who gave who to who? God the Father gave you, you, the church, me, to Jesus Christ as a gift. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And last time we were together, we went back to the Akadah. The Akadah, Genesis 22. What's the Akadah? The binding, the binding of Isaac. Right? How he willingly laid down his life. But then we also looked at the offering that was given by Abraham through his servant Eliezer to his son Isaac, which was Rebecca. Rebecca, the gift. So... We are a gift from the Father to the Son, but purchased through the sacrifice of the Son. Isn't that amazing? Huh? Yeah. Eight times in this chapter, he's going to say, you've been given to Jesus by the Father as a gift. And this is eternal life, that they may know you. What does that word know? Yeah. Yeah, that, it's, it's the equivalent to... Greek is the equivalent to the Hebrew, yada, which means to know intimately, not just to have head knowledge. I remember I was in Belize uh, on a missions trip down there, and then I was in a church there one Sunday morning, and this Belizean turned around, and the service was over, and he says, hey, man. I said, yes? Man, you know the 23rd Psalm, man? Oh, yeah, I know the 20th. I started reciting. No, 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 man. No, man. Here's what I really want to know. Do you know the shepherd of the 23rd Psalm, man? Oh, boy. Now, that takes it to a different level, doesn't it? Yes. Doesn't it? Do you know the Lord <coughs> intimately? Having union, communion with the Lord. Hmm. Where you come to that place where you surrender your life in service to the Lord. That's what it means here, to know. What does it say? And you have given authority to all, over to all flesh, and he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they may know you. You see, eternal life is not an, uh, an object or an item. It's not so much a place as it is a person. It's not what you know. Eternal life, it is. It's not what you know. It's. If you know Jesus and you know him intimately and you have communion with the Lord, you have eternal life because he is eternal life. Age abiding life, life without end. You know, we did the way of the master class Friday night and yesterday morning. I wish more of you would have participated because we want to be part of that 2% that shares our faith. And I think a good introductory question that I ask a lot of people is, you believe in death? It's a certainty, isn't it? Yep. Until the Lord comes to take us out of this world, death is a certainty. A hundred out of a hundred? A thousand out of a thousand? A million out of a million? And so what happens after that? And most people are very troubled to think about that, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, but when you know the Lord and you have possessed eternal life through the relationship that you have with Jesus because you know the Lord Jesus, I have no fear of death. Why? I'm as dead now as I'm ever going to be. In Christ. Isn't that true? Now, I'm not afraid of dying. I'm just concerned about how it might happen. You know. <laughs> and this is eternal life that you may know him, the true God. How many gods are there? No, no, no. You Christians, you believe in three gods, don't you? No, nay, never, never. We believe, as the Hebrews did, Deuteronomy chapter 6, what, what do we call that? The Shema. Right? Hear, O Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Right? The Lord our God, the Lord is one. One. We believe in one God, but one God manifested himself in three persons. One God. Yes. The only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. Aren't we glad that Jesus doesn't leave things undone? Hmm. Hmm. Who did we talk about last week? Who was born to that young maiden, Hannah? Samuel. Samuel. Some of you were here last week. Some of you were sleeping. Samuel. Samuel. Samuel was the last judge. He was the first prophet, and he was also a priest. Prophet. 
priest, and judge. He alone, the only man in the Bible that carries those three offices like unto Jesus. Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. King, king right? Now, Samuel was leading Israel at that time. They didn't have a king. They weren't a monarchy yet. They were a, a uh, theocracy, remember, under Moses and Joshua. And then it was anarchy. And now it's going to lead to a monarchy because they want a king. And so Samuel is going to consent because God said, look, they haven't rejected you, Samuel. They rejected me. Go ahead and give them a king. But here's what's going to happen as a result of it. And he laid out exactly what would happen. Be careful what you ask for. And then God gave some instructions to Saul through Samuel about taking care of some people that would contaminate God's people. Who were they? The Amalekites, the descendants of Anak, the giants, right? Who were the giants? The descendants, the Nephilim, the descendants of the Bene Ha'ilohim who made it with the daughters of men. And boy, I don't understand that one, but I read it and I'd believe it. But nonetheless, did Saul finish the work that God had him do? No. 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 What happened from that military campaign? He came back and Samuel said, what is it <laughs> that I'm hearing? <laughs> oh, I brought them back for sacrifice to the Lord. Didn't the Lord tell you to destroy them all? For the Lord desires obedience more than he does sacrifice. For it is better to obey than to sacrifice. Uh, some people think, you know, I'll sacrifice an hour on a Sunday morning. Well, a little bit more here. Uh, <laughs> I'll endure Pastor Ritz sermons. You know, and I'll even throw in a couple of bucks. Uh, and, uh, do we have any plates to pass this morning? No? We never do, do we? I'm sorry. We don't, we can't, you can't do that here. Oh, but some people think, well, I'll make a little sacrifice, and that'll appease God. Is that really what he's looking for? No. What's he looking for? Obedience. Obedience to what? To his word. To his word. Whatever his instruction is. And then worst of all, what did Samuel say? Who was that? Saul? Who was that? It was the devil. No, it wasn't the devil, but he was a type of the devil. What was his name? <laughs> right? Hey, <laughs> guy. Agag, the king. Listen to me. He was the king of the Amalekites, the descendants of the Anakin. The Anakin were half human, half... I don't know how much you know about that, but there's a history there. Hmm? And so that man represented the devil, the worst, right? And Saul didn't kill him. He was supposed to destroy it. Aren't you supposed to destroy the works of the devil in your life? Aren't you just to destroy any temptation, any desire that the devil would bring into your life? Aren't you? And how are you supposed to do that? In the power of the Holy Spirit, right? And so what did Samuel do? He took him back. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. It was the pastor that hacked the guy up. Wow. I'm in good company sometimes. He came and he finished the work. Not like Saul. Now, we're instructed by Paul that we should finish well. Right? You know, some people start out really well in their walk of faith. But then as time goes on and difficulties arise and they're not spending the time they should cultivating the relationship with the Lord and growing in his word, uh, then they begin to get involved in the world again, in worldly affairs, in worldly activity, and so many of them don't finish well. Now, I'm going to get clear to you. I believe once saved, always and forever saved. saved. You can't lose your salvation. It's a gift of God. You didn't do anything to earn it, and you can't do anything to keep it. Aren't we glad of that? But I know who saved me, and I know who can keep me. But I have to keep my heart, my life, in his hands. And as I do, he keeps me from those things that would cause me to bring shame or dishonor to his name, where I wouldn't glorify him as I desire to. Jesus was tempted in every single way you and I are. Did you know that? The Bible tells me that. He was fully God, but he was fully man. He put aside his deity, didn't remove his deity, he just put it aside, that power that he had, so he could show us how we successfully 
deal with temptations. How did he deal with temptations? The word of God. With us, say the Lord. How should you deal with the temptations that come upon you? Through the word of God and through prayer. And we can be successful. We don't have to fall prey to those things. Now, I believe once saved, always saved, but, but you cannot, you, you can choose to act like that old man or that old woman all over again. And once you go down that road, you'll be amazed at how quickly you can slip away. Not lose your salvation, but you lose your testimony, you lose your witness. It never should have to be. I want to encourage you this morning that he who began a good work in you will complete it to the day of Christ, to the day of the Lord's return, if, if you stay focused on the Lord and his work in your heart and in your life. We're going to talk about the keeping power of God, not only to guard us and protect us, but, but to, to keep us through nurturing and strengthening and walking with us. Hmm. Yes, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. What was that work he had given him to do? Go to Hebrews chapter 1 for a minute. There's three things that Jesus really came to do when he came to earth. And it's nicely laid out in these first four verses in Hebrews chapter 1. Take your time. If you have to, go to the front of your Bible. You know, I used to have to put tabs in my Bible because I didn't know one book from another when I first got saved. My, my first wife, she knew the Bible inside out, upside down. I didn't know it at all. I'd start learning the Bible. Then I'd tell her I was reading the book of Job. She, she said, why, are you unemployed? <laughs> Did you lose your job? No, no, Job. She's Job. It's Job. You know, some of those, some of those names are hard to pronounce, aren't they? Yeah. Malashala Hasbaz. Oh boy. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Hebrews. You there? Everybody there? If you're there, just look up. Everybody's there. Don't want to get ahead of you. Surely don't want you behind me. We want to walk this walk together, don't we? Yeah. So Hebrews chapter 1, God at various times and various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. So there was a revelation given of God through the prophets, the prophetic ministry. Who was the first prophet? We just mentioned it, Samuel, and many, many after that. But Moses himself said in Deuteronomy, there would come one after me, a prophet like unto myself, but far greater. He would be the anointed. He would be the Messiah. Jesus himself, right? And that's precisely what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Various times, various ways, God spoke through the fathers by the prophets, but in these last days has spoken by his son, Jesus. So one of the reasons why Jesus came was to be the perfect expression or to display to us, to share with us the knowledge of who God really is. And what do we learn about God through Jesus? whole lot. What, what, what's the greatest lesson we learn? That his is amazing. What? His grace is amazing. Listen to beloved, even after you're saved, you can, you can make some bad choices. But those bad choices will never separate you from the love of God. Oh, you'll be ashamed one day. And so I would not encourage that at all. I'm not giving you a license to presume upon the grace of God. The grace of God was given so that you could serve God acceptably, reverently, and with a godly fear. Why? Because our Lord is a consuming fire. You know, some, some Christians have gone in the wrong direction so poorly, so badly, God has to take them out of this world so they don't affect anybody else. It would be a shameful thing going to the Lord that way, wouldn't it? Hmm? Having to hang my head in shame for all he has done for me. So please, understand. Yes, yes, you can make mistakes. Yes, you can start going in the wrong direction. I don't believe you can lose your salvation. Once saved, always saved. But we're to demonstrate our salvation, display our salvation, live for the glory of God through our obedience to his word. And there's such a joy that will fill your heart and your life. When you make that teshuva, to turn unto the Lord, that Jewish word teshuva means to repent to do a 180. Teshuvah is return, draw near unto the Lord, and the Lord will draw near unto you. 
cry out unto the Lord, and the Lord will hear. Hmm? Jesus came to be that perfect expression of the Father to us, and particularly the Father's grace and love. What is the chief attribute of God? Love. God is love. And he who knows not love knows not. You, you, you can't say you know God if you're an unloving person. Isn't that right? The Son, whom he has appointed heir over all things. Why? Because he created everything. Through him, through whom also he made the worlds. Who, being the brightness of his glory and the expressed image of his person, the upholding of all things by the word of his power. Yes, he's the one that holds all things together. As I said, that Prototokos of Colossians, the most Christocentric book in the Bible, where Christ holds everything together. He's that laminin. Remember what laminin was? The adhesion molecule that holds you and I together physically, holds our body together, holds every cell tissue in the body, that adhesion molecule called laminin. And if you get a high-powered microscope and you look at a laminin cell, what does it look like? Gross. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Wow. And Jesus is that laminin. That's what he's saying here. Who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, God, and upholding all things by the power, by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. So he came to represent God the Father to us. What was the second thing he came to do? I'm sorry? He came to be the propitiation. He came to be the propitiation. But it's a big word, isn't it? What does that mean? The appeasement sacrifice. Yeah, the appeasing sacrifice. The appeasing, but there's a higher power that has been offended, and now he needs to be appeased. He came to purge your sin. He came to be a ransom for men. He came to die for you. Hey, you know what the world thinks? The world thinks that if they don't believe in your Jesus, they're going to hell. Is that right, Mark? Why are they going to hell? Why? What is it? They're sinners. Do you understand? For all have sinned. sinned and fall short of the glory. Have you ever sinned? Has anyone not sinned here? <laughs> well, we got a good group of honest people, right? But if you, if you continue in your sins, then your destiny is hell. Why? Because a holy God is just. If he is holy, he's just. If he's just, he is righteous. And a holy God, a just God, a righteous God has to judge every sin. For the wages of sin, singular in the text, the wages of sin is? Death. Oh, boy. Now, i got to be honest with you. I've, I've committed a mountain of sins for which the Lord has forgiven me. I came to the Lord late in life, and, and I can still sit down and shed tears and regret over what I was. What I was determined what I did. But I've been washed, I've been sanctified, I've been cleansed, I've been changed. And so have some of you, most of you, right? Now, that's what you need to explain to this world out there. Because I have had many conversations where a person will say, well, you think if I don't believe what you believe, I'm going to go to hell. I said, no, I don't. You think if I don't believe in your Jesus, I'm, no, I don't. Whether Jesus ever came, every man, woman, and child would go where? Why? They're sinners. People go to hell because they're sinners. And a holy God cannot allow sin to exist in his presence. So there has to be something done with the sin problem. And God himself, Isaac, said to his father Abraham as they're ascending Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is Mount Zion. Mount Zion is Calvary, the very place where Jesus would be crucified thousands of years later. As they're ascending the mountain, his son Isaac says to him, Father, Father, we have the fire. We have the wood. Where's the sacrifice? And Abraham prophetically in the Hebrew text says, God himself will be the sacrifice. Wow. Isn't that amazing? So that, that's the choice we have to give the world. They need, first of all, you need to get them to understand that they're sinners. Most unbelievers think that they're good poisons, right? Are there any really good poisons? No, no. We're all brought into this world and we're all sinners. 
And we can't do a thing about that sin problem. And every sin will be judged. Every sin is either judged by the individual in hell or it's judged by Jesus at the cross. Do you understand that? Every sin. That's the choice. Now, I would rather choose the salvation that Jesus came to offer, came to represent the express image of the Father, but he also came to redeem those whom the Father has chosen to give unto the Son. How do I process that one? Oh, boy, if I sit and think about that one, smoke comes out of my ears. But I believe it. I am thankful for the elect. Aren't you? Yeah. So he came to redeem us from our sins. Please make sure you explain that to people. They think that if they don't believe in our Jesus, they're going to hell. No, our Jesus came to save them from hell. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, and to live with him forever and ever and ever. Every human being was created to live forever. Right now, temporarily, my spirit possesses this body, right? But I have to tell you, at my age and the way that this body feels some mornings, you know, I got that P.O.D. You know what P.O.D. is, Jimmy? Pain of the day. Every, way, every day I wake up, I got a different pain somewhere this morning. It's right here in that knee. You know? <laughs> so I can't wait to shed this body. I can't wait for that new glorious body I'm going to get. Right? And I'm confident of that. I'm thankful that this body isn't going to live forever, but my spirit does. And every single human being that's ever been created by God as he breathed the breath of life into them. Oh, how did he get them going? How did God create the first parents, Adam and Eve? With a, he brought them to life with a kiss. Breathe the breath of life. A kiss. Brother. The love of God. Everybody has a spirit that lives forever. You're either going to live in the presence of God, which we call heaven, or in the absence of God, which we know is hell. That's the choice. Every human being, you're either the object of his perfect love or the object of his perfect wrath. What makes the determining difference? Jesus. Jesus. We were enemies, and now we sit at your table. You think of an Old Testament story? Enemies of God, and now they sit at the table. What was that boy's name? The cripple? Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, of the house of Saul. The house of Saul were enemies with the house of David. And David becomes king over Israel. And David's a type of who? David is a type of who? No. No. Somebody else is a type of Jesus in that story as we look at it allegorically. David was a type of God the Father. And who was David's closest friend? Jonathan. John, he loved Jonathan. And Jonathan is a type of who? Jesus. And Jonathan and Saul were both killed in battle with the Philistines because his father had disobeyed the Lord, Saul. And David was so grieving the loss of his friend Jonathan. And the whole house of Saul thought for certain when David rose to power that he was going to kill everyone of the descendants of Saul. And so handmaiden of this young boy, Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, went in hiding. But as she ran away to escape what possibly could have happened, she dropped that boy. And what happened to him? He was a crippled boy from the rest of his life. She dropped him as a child, broke both his legs, and he remained crippled. Aren't we thankful for all the medical advances that can be made today? Yeah. This knee that's troubling me, one day I'm going to have a new knee put in. I'll probably have it done the same day and walk out that night. Isn't that amazing what can happen today? But not then. That boy was destined to be crippled for the rest of his life. Crippled, lame, but not lazy. And so David, as a type of God the Father, says, Is there no one left of the house of Jonathan that I could bless? I love Jonathan. I love Jonathan. Who's David a type of? Who's Jonathan a type of? Jesus. And who's Mephibosheth a type of? Us. The church, crippled by sin, weren't we? Come on. Do we have any right to sit at the king's table? No. No. 
I don't know why I got down on this story. We'll end with this story, I guess. <laughs> We're not going to get to the second part of his prayer. <laughs> not unless you want to spend the afternoon. <laughs> Aren't we glad the Lord takes over this service? It's a very important concept for you to grasp. So they came to David and said, there is a crippled boy. Can't do anything for himself. He's crippled. And oh, by the way, they stole his property, stole his land, and, and he's left destitute. David said, bring him to me. And so when they brought him to David with them, Mephibosheth think was going to happen. Thought he was going to kill him. And what do we deserve? Death. Death. But what does God give us instead? His love, his grace, become joint heirs with Christ. And so David said to Mephibosheth, that cripple who represents us, you will be as one of my own sons. We've been given now the spirit of adoption by which we call him Abba, Father. We are the Hariothesia, the adult and adopted children of God. He said, now I call you my sons and my daughters when we're in Christ. You will always sit at my table. You will be as one of my own sons, and you will sit there, and I will care for you forever. We sit at the Lord's table, although we were enemies. And so when David looked down the table every day, every meal, and he saw Mephibosheth, who did he really see? Jonathan. Jonathan. Why did he take care of Mephibosheth? Why? Because of his love of? You get it. It's not about it's all about, boy, the church has got that all upside down today, don't they? I lift my hands to how great I am. That's their song. So the difference in becoming one who is the object of his perfect wrath or the object of his perfect love is who resides in your heart. And when God the Father looks down from heaven, he doesn't look down on you any longer and see your sin. He looks down in you and sees Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. He came to be the perfect expression of the Father, the Father's love to the world. He, he came to redeem you and I from our sins, to save us and rescue us from the wrath of God. God himself rescued us from his own wrath. Isn't that amazing? Hmm? Hmm. Hebrews chapter 1. Who being the, the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, preeminent over all things, angels, demons, whatever, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than them. Wow. So, he came to show us who the Father was and his love. He came to redeem us from our sins. He came to do what? Jesus is coming soon. What did he come to do? Take you where he is. To take you to heaven. What's that fourth cup we're going to drink? Remember we talked about that? No whining. No whining, okay? I made a covenant with the Lord. I will not drink alcohol until I drink it with new, uh, with him in the Father's kingdom. Because that's what he said. He didn't, he didn't drink that fourth cup at the Seder, remember? And what was that fourth cup called? Taking. The taking out. The taking out, where he takes his church out of this world. That's the third thing he came to do, to deliver us out of this world. We're going to talk about that at length next week. But he, he held that cup up and he said, I will not drink of the fruit of the wine again until, until I drink it with you anew in my Father's kingdom. What a party that's going to be. Hmm? Intoxicated by love, not by some chemical substance. Amen? Okay, I'm going to let you go. I, I, I kept you overtime last week, so I'm going to give you a break this week. How's that sound? <laughs> Next week, we're going to get into the prayer that he prayed for his disciples. Listen to this now. Listen to this now. 
Now, we talked about Jesus living for the glory of the Father through obedience, right? Now, listen to me. Listen to me. And you go home and you study this. Everything that God the Father did for the Son so he could glorify the Father, God the Holy Spirit has done for you so we could glorify the Son. Do you know that? Everything, every tool, every power, every resource, every provision has been made available to us by the Holy Spirit to live lives that glorify God. The great mystery of Colossians, right? That mystery on Christ in me, the hope. hope of glory. What does it mean? That right now, today, today, in this body, I can glorify God. Isn't that wonderful? All you simply have to do is yield to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I cannot do it. But in my weakness, your strength is perfected. It's made perfect, Lord. Now, we're going to talk about the prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples. But wait a minute. What, what gospel demonstrates Jesus' need for prayer more than any other? Luke. Luke displays the humanity of Christ and shows how often Christ got away to pray. Why? He was fully man, fully God. In his deity... It wasn't necessary. In his humanity, he showed us. Would you do me a favor? Would you bless me and pray that the Lord would give me the prayer life he wants me to have? I'm not happy with my prayer life. Maybe you are. But oh boy, when I look at the prayer life of Jesus, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of how little I pray and how often he did. And before, before he selected the 12, what did he do? He prayed all night. After he selected the 12, what did he say to Peter? Peter, Peter, Satan has sought you. He's requested you. He's asked for you. He wants to sift you like wheat, man. But you know what? I prayed for you. He, he prayed for them before he chose them. He prayed for them during his earthly ministry. Chapter 17, we're going to see. He prays just before he leaves again for them. And oh, by the way, what is he doing right now? interceding on our behalf, praying before the throne right now. Isn't that wonderful? Do you know how well we're kept? Hmm? Yeah. We are a well-kept bride by our bridegroom. Isn't that wonderful? Now, walk in the reality of that keeping power of Jesus. I don't have to fall prey to the desires of my flesh. I don't have to fall prey to those things that will tempt me. I can throw out all those Brewster's coupons. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying. Shall we stand? Pastor David, you got a closing song?